Hello and welcome to NOAA Round 7, Session 3. My name is Megor Razavilar and I will be facilitating this session. Please join me in welcoming our presenter, Dr. Mike Paulden. Dr. Paulden is an associate professor at the University of Alberta School of Public Health. His research is focused on developing appropriate methods for the economic evaluation of health technologies. Today's topic is should CADIF, that is the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health, adopt a societal perspective? This seminar will consider the arguments in favor of and against the publicly funded healthcare system perspective and the comprehensive societal perspective. It will also consider the practical implications of any change in CADIF's perspective, including the need to modify, perhaps substantially, the $50,000 per quality threshold that CADIF informally uses to assist the cost effectiveness of technology so that this would be consistent with the societal perspective. Before we begin, I'll go over some event housekeeping. So participants will be muted throughout the webinar. To submit any questions during the webinar, please use the Q&A function. Just a friendly reminder that the Q&A function is different from the chat function. The Q&A answering your questions will be facilitated during the final 20 minutes of the webinar. Thank you again for joining us. I will now hand over to Dr. Paul. Thanks very much, Nagar. Thanks for inviting me to give this webinar. Uh, to, as you mentioned, today I'm going to be talking about whether Cadeth should adopt a societal perspective. So I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, let me know if, uh, if you can't hear me okay, and I will sort that out. Uh, so before we begin, I'm going to cover some conflicts of interest and disclosures. Uh, my only employment is as a faculty member at the University of Alberta. Um, I was a member of Cadiz Health Economics Advisory Council from its creation in April 2019 until its dissolution in June of last year. During this time, I prepared a white paper for Cadiz on its perspective, and this presentation draws on some of the ideas outlined in that white paper, and I would like to thank Cadiz for supporting the development of that white paper. Uh, the views expressed in this presentation are my own, and they do not necessarily reflect those of the University of Alberta or of Cadiz. And I have no financial interest or other interest in CADF's methods for economic evaluation, including the perspective that CADF adopts. So let's do some background to begin with. And since 1994, uh, CADF and its precursor have published guidelines for the economic evaluation of health technologies in Canada. And a particularly controversial topic within these guidelines concerns the primary perspective, the reference case perspective of the economic evaluation. The second edition of these guidelines published way back in 1997 recommended that, quote, the primary analytic perspective or viewpoint for pharmacoeconomic studies should be the comprehensive societal perspective. That is, all costs and benefits should be identified regardless of who incurs the cost or who receives the benefits. But this all changed in the third edition, which was published back in 2006, which instead recommended that the primary analysis should use, quote, the perspective of a publicly funded healthcare system. And this narrower publicly funded healthcare system perspective was retained as the reference case perspective in the most recent fourth edition of the guidelines published in 2017. Although there is some flexibility. So to quote those guidelines, where other perspectives are of interest to the decision maker and could have a substantial impact on the results of the analysis, these should be included as additional non-reference case analyses. And we'll come back to that later. If any of you are interested in reading the current CADF guidelines, uh, this is the fourth edition available from CADF's website. I've put a forwarding URL on this slide. You can type that into your web browser and it will redirect you to CADF's website where you can download these guidelines. Now, the reason this topic is uh, quite interesting at the moment is because just last year, uh, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization or NACI published a competing set of guidelines intended for economic evaluations of vaccination programs specifically, so public health uh, guidelines. And an important distinction between these guidelines and CADF's guidelines is that NACI recommends that both a societal and a publicly funded healthcare system perspective should be reported by analysts in that reference case. And these are the guidelines from NACI. Again, I would recommend anyone uh, read this if you've not read them before. Uh, the URL is very long, but if you go to the forwarding URL on this slide, it will take you to the website where you can read uh, NACI's guidelines. And I should also say before we continue that uh, this there's a lot to cover in this presentation. Um, I made a recording of this presentation last night, which I uploaded to YouTube, 
And at the end of this presentation, I will be giving you all a link to that video where we go over the slides in a bit more detail. We take a little bit more than an hour to go over this presentation. So if there's anything that you want a bit more detail about in this presentation, take a look at that recording uh, afterwards at your leisure. So it's an opportune time to consider whether Cadath should maintain its reference case perspective as the publicly funded health system perspective, or change its reference case perspective back to a societal perspective, which is what it had in the early days, the first and second edition of its guidelines, or perhaps require that both perspectives be considered within the reference case in common with, with NACI's guidelines from last year. And it's also worth bearing in mind that Cadeth is not considering this in a vacuum. There are other health technology assessment agencies having the same kind of discussions, deliberations around their perspective. So in 2022, NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, which is the UK's uh, primary health technology assessment agency, they also considered three very similar options. Uh, the first one was to retain a health sector perspective, which is the term that they give to the publicly funded health system perspective. It's exactly the same as Cadeth's primary perspective, um, but with the flexibility to adopt partial societal perspective in particular circumstances. So very, very similar to what Cadeth currently recommends. The second option that NICE considered was to retain that perspective, but strengthen internal processes to ensure flexibilities are used consistently. So where Cadeth allows non-reference case analyses that adopt a broader perspective, NICE does as well, but what they're considering in that second option is perhaps have some stronger processes to make sure that there's consistency across economic evaluations, right? You don't want to allow uh, a non-reference case analysis um, for one particular drug that considers certain aspects of the societal perspective. And then the next week you have a different economic evaluation that has entirely different aspects of a societal perspective. You need some consistency. That's the second option. And then the third one is to initiate further exploration of formally adopting a wider societal perspective. And I would strongly recommend those who are interested in this topic, take a look at this document that was presented at the NICE board meeting at the end of 2022. I've put the URL on this slide. And again, there'll be a recording of this presentation. You can also check out the YouTube video that I'll give you a link to at the end. If you want to get that URL, again, you can pause the recording and get that URL. But I would strongly recommend having a look at this document. So a quick overview of today's presentation. We're gonna go over what is a publicly funded health system perspective? What's different about a societal perspective? the potential for discrimination under a societal perspective, which is one of the more controversial aspects of a societal perspective. I'm then gonna talk about Cadiz's informal $50,000 per quality cost-effectiveness threshold, whether that's appropriate under the current publicly funded health system perspective and the implications for that threshold, that informal threshold, if Cadiz were to adopt a societal perspective. Uh, what would the impact be of adopting a societal perspective with and without a modification to that cost effectiveness threshold? And then finally, some recommendations. I will also be making recommendations throughout the presentation, but these are just a final set of recommendations. So first of all, what is a publicly funded health system perspective? So I'd like you to imagine that we have a public healthcare system that has a budget, so a provincial health system here in Canada. And imagine that there is a new health technology that has come to market and it has a positive incremental cost, which means that it costs more than the current care that patients who would benefit from that technology currently receive. So if we were to reimburse this new health technology, there's a positive incremental cost. Dollars have to flow from the budget to pay for this new health technology. But the reason we're interested in this new health technology is it also has a positive incremental benefit. There are expected health improvements for patients who receive this new technology. So we're in a dilemma here. This technology improves the health, the lives of the patients who receive it, but it also imposes a cost on that budget. And the implication of that cost being imposed on the budget is that there is now less funding for other health care. And there's a variety of possible implications of this. There might be longer waiting lists. Uh, there might be delisting of other services. There could be other investment opportunities foregone. And it's important to remember that these foregone investment opportunities still arise, even if the budget is not perfectly fixed, even if additional resources are made available to pay for this technology, well, those additional resources could have been used for these 
other investment opportunities. And what are these other investment opportunities? There's, a, there's an almost endless list of them. Um, here's an article from the CMAJ published last year that talks about worsening primary care access in Canada. And the most striking part of that article to me is the following quote. More than one in five Canadians, an estimated six and a half million people, do not have a family physician or nurse practitioner that they see regularly, according to an excuse me, according to a national survey. That's a dramatic increase since 2019, when stats can estimate that only four and a half million people did not have a regular healthcare provider. So that's one possible way that you could invest those dollars. You could expand access to primary care, uh, increase the number of Canadians who have a family physician. Here's an article from the National Post published last month, Canadians dying while on medical wait list reaches five year high report finds. 17,000 deaths among patients waiting for life-saving or quality of life procedures. So that's another way that you could invest healthcare dollars. You could shorten waiting lists for existing treatments uh, for which waiting lists have, have grown over the last few years. Um, here's an article that was published just yesterday uh, in Alberta. Alberta pauses participation in national kidney donor matching program because of surgery capacity shortage. Okay, so there are real implications for patients as a result of the current shortage in capacity for the growing waiting lists across Canada. And these are the investment opportunities that are foregone when additional dollars are spent on new health technologies. Those dollars cannot be spent twice. Those could have been spent on other ways of improving the lives of Canadians. So coming back to this diagram here, because of the the less funding that we have for these other healthcare programs, there are expected health losses. When we pay for this technology, we are diverting dollars from other uh, effective uses of those dollars. And so not only do we get the expected health improvements, which is the good thing, we have the expected health losses, which is the negative thing arising from the incremental costs of the new technology. And under a publicly funded healthcare system perspective, the purpose of a health economic evaluation is to consider the expected impact on the overall health of the population. How do those expected health improvements compare to the expected health losses? And it's really important to be clear that the focus is population health. It's not dollars spent. It's not other economic considerations such as productivity. Under this narrow perspective that Cabot currently adopts in its reference case, the focus is population health. What are the health gains that this new technology provides? What are those opportunity costs, those foregone uh, health for other patients as a result of the costs that are imposed on the healthcare budget? Now, if a new technology is very effective and the price is reasonable, then we might find that the expected health improvements exceed the expected health losses. And this technology would be considered cost effective from this perspective. It's, it, it's, it's expected to improve the overall health of the population. And conversely, if we find that the expected health improvements are not very large or the cost is extremely high, well, then that technology would be considered not cost effective. It would be expected to diminish the overall health of the population. Yes, the patients that receive the technology get health improvements, but when the incremental costs fall on the budget, it displaces these other investment opportunities and that impacts the lives of other Canadians. So let's now move on to what's different about a societal perspective. And a good place to start is Cadet's guidelines, uh, the fourth edition of their guidelines. There is a table in these guidelines, table one, and we'll zoom in on this table now. Here's the top half of the table. And you can see that we have the reference case perspective, the public healthcare payer, and the types of costs that are considered within that perspective. So the only costs considered within Cadet's reference case right now are costs to the publicly funded healthcare payer, things like drugs, equipment, all the sorts of costs that fall upon our provincial healthcare budget. And then there's three other non-reference case perspectives considered here, private payer, broader government payer, but for our purposes, we're gonna focus on societal. And societal includes all of these different categories of costs. So in addition to the costs included under the reference case perspective currently, we have costs that fall on the private insurer. We have costs to government beyond healthcare, things like social services, affordable housing, education. Here's the bottom half of that table now. We have costs that fall on patients and informal caregivers, like travel costs, out-of-pocket payments. 
Uh, we have productivity costs, and this is a very important cost under a societal perspective. So lost productivity due to reduced working capacity or short-term, long-term absence from work. Um, we also have unpaid work, so housework, uh, the lost time from that. We can assign a value to that. And also the cost to the employer for hiring and training a replacement worker. Next, we come to the outcomes. And under the current perspective that Cadeth has, that reference case perspective, uh, the only outcomes considered are health effects relevant to patients and informal caregivers. So health-related quality of life, life years gained, clinical morbidity. What a societal perspective adds is those non-health effects in that bottom row. So things like reductions in criminal behavior, better educational outcomes, okay, all sorts of outcomes that are important to people, they're valuable, and they go beyond health. And there are many, many studies, really excellent studies that have been published in the last few years, which are trying to quantify what these additional benefits are. So here is a paper that was published last month in Pharmacoeconomics, um, which looks at family and caregiver health spillovers in health economic evaluations. Okay, trying to quantify um, you, uh, what those what those spillover effects are, right? When you improve the health of a patient, it's not just the patient that benefits, it can also spill over and provide benefits to caregivers and family members. This is just one of many, many um, studies that have been published, which uh, we can use to inform a broader perspective. Let's return now to those guidelines published by NACI uh, last year. And here's a quote that caught my eye from these guidelines. The task group has given serious consideration excuse me, serious consideration to the adoption of two perspectives with the acknowledgement that there are arguments against the use of the societal perspective as a reference case. For example, a lack of an empirically estimated societal cost effectiveness threshold. And I'm gonna to return to that later in the presentation. The lack of established methods to quantify select broader impacts into monetary terms. So I mentioned a moment ago that there's been some excellent work published in the last few years, but there's also lots of aspects of a societal perspective that we're not yet in a position uh, to quantify. The task group recognizes that many arguments for or against this reference case involve normative judgment and social preferences. Hence, there is no correct choice. And this is very, very important. And I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, talking about this. Um, however, before that, I want to go a little bit further than the task force, and I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to make a recommendation here, right? Rather than saying there's just no correct choice, I think we can actually say something uh, a little bit more helpful than that. So where the purpose of an economic evaluation is descriptive, I would recommend that a societal perspective should be adopted to provide a comprehensive account of a health technology's economic impact on society. However, where the purpose is to inform a decision which is the purpose of the economic evaluations that CADETH conducts, uh, whether that's regarding whether to reimburse the health technology or what price should be negotiated for that technology, the perspective must align with the values and principles of the decision maker. And so in that first paragraph where I say, you know, descriptive, I'm talking about an economic evaluation done from 30,000 feet. The purpose is just to try and account for all of the implications of adopting this technology, of course, you should adopt a societal perspective. And that recent work that has attempted to quantify what those broader benefits are is incredibly useful uh, for doing this. But when the purpose of the economic evaluation is to inform a decision, you have to take into account the principles and the values of the decision maker. And make sure you're not including anything in your economic evaluation that would conflict with those basic principles and values. And let, that brings us on to the potential for discrimination under a societal perspective. And let's start by considering productivity because it is perhaps the most controversial aspect of a societal perspective when it comes to issues of discrimination. There are two common measurement approaches for uh, productivity. So the first is the human capital approach, which uses an individual's wage or salary as a proxy for the value of any lost productivity due to illness. The second approach we can use to measure productivity is something called the friction cost approach, which considers an individual's lost productivity due to illness in terms of the cost of their employer to train another worker to do the same job. So that first approach would say, well, if you're sick, then we will look at your wage or your salary to uh, as a proxy for how productive you are. Um, and that is the productivity loss because you're sick. Whereas the second approach would say, well, hang on a moment. There might be a pool of unemployed labor. And if one worker is sick, perhaps we can train another worker to do the same job. And so we haven't actually lost all of that productivity. It usually would result in a, in a smaller 
productivity loss, that friction cost approach. Okay, so these are two competing approaches for measuring productivity. And right now, CADIS uh, guidelines mention the friction cost approach, and there's guidelines in other countries that mention human capital approach. Um, so uh, yeah, two different approaches in the literature. And the human capital approach will, by its very nature, assign greater value to restoring the health of highly paid individuals. And the friction cost approach will assign a greater value to restoring the health of those with highly skilled jobs that require extensive education, training, and or professional qualifications. And of course, there's a, there's a large degree of overlap between these two. Often those jobs uh, that are highly skilled are also highly paid, of course, right? Now, this brings us on to the first question. And this is a rhetorical question. Uh, I'm not gonna put it out to a poll or anything, um, but these are just, just a thought experiment that I'd like us uh, to think about. In principle, should two patients with identical health conditions and an identical capacity to derive health benefits from treatment be treated differently by a Canadian public health system on the basis that one is a highly paid professional and the other is unemployed? Okay, so I'm just imagining if something happened to me, if I had a heart attack right now and I was rushed to the hospital, um, is it reasonable if there was another patient there exactly like me? Uh, in every possible respect, except they're unemployed, is it reasonable to give priority to me on the basis that I'm employed and that person is not? Um, and there's a couple of possible ways of answering this. Uh, one would be, I'll call this answer A, yes, the patient should be treated differently. Treating the professional and returning them to work would increase economic growth and tax revenues, yet fewer economic benefits would arise from treating the unemployed patient. So given that we have scarce public health care resources, it is rational to, priorities, uh, to prioritize care for the highly paid professional and to deprioritize care for the unemployed patient. Remember, with a constrained budget, you cannot prioritize care for one patient without deprioritizing other patients. And so it's entirely rational to get that professional back to work sooner. The sooner we do that, the more they can earn, they can pay tax. We can use tax to, to fund other people's health care, right? So it makes perfect sense to prioritize the highly paid professional. That's answer A. Answer B would be, no, the patient should be treated identically. Two key objectives of Canadian health policy are to provide, quote, access to quality health care without financial or other barriers, and to make progress in, quote, treating sickness and alleviating the consequences of disease and disability among all income groups. And it follows from this that an individual's productivity or anything related to it should not be considered when allocating public health care resources. And if you're wondering where these quotes are taken from, they're taken from the preamble to the Canada Health Act. So under a societal perspective, a greater value will be assigned to treating the highly paid professional if treatment allows each patient to return to work sooner. And it follows that it's possible that a, an effective but expensive treatment might be found to be cost effective for the highly paid professional, but not for the unemployed patient. And this difference would arise solely due to differences in these individuals' incomes and employment, and hence productivity, not due to any differences in their capacity to derive health benefits from treatment. But under a publicly funded healthcare perspective, if you were trying to answer this question under that perspective, well, then the value of treating each patient would be identical. And this is because the health effects arising from treatment are identical for each patient. And that's the only outcome considered under this perspective. Any differences between the individuals in terms of productivity would not be considered and so would not impact on the results of the economic evaluation. Um, but many of you will be thinking, well, hang on a moment. We don't actually do economic evaluation on the level of the individual, right? If two people show up at the emergency room, no one's doing an economic evaluation of those two individuals. The economic evaluations that Cadeth considers are done at the subgroup level, right? And so is it possible to avoid this potential discrimination by using a single average estimate of productivity for all members of the target population or for every member of society, okay? So can we just uh, average away, aggregate away this uh, problem? So if we were to apply an average estimate of productivity to all members of a population subgroup, this would avoid individual level discrimination on the basis of productivity within that subgroup. However, average productivity would still be expected to differ across population subgroups due to differences in the composition of these subgroups by age, sex, gender, race, and or other characteristics, such that discrimination would still arise at the subgroup level. 
So for example, consider a condition that primarily occurs in a retired population, such as lung cancer. Since average economic productivity is lower in retirement, any productivity gains from treating these patients will be limited relative to those from treating other populations, such as working age individuals. A societal perspective that averages productivity across all patients in a technology's target population would still discriminate against patients in subgroups with lower average productivity than other subgroups. So just aggregating to the level of the target population is not sufficient. There would still be discrimination. The only way to avoid this subgroup level discrimination it would be to assume the same productivity for every member of society. And I've heard people advocate for this approach. Uh, the problem with this approach is that it does not reflect real world productivity in any meaningful sense. Okay, it is simply not true to say that every member of society has the same productivity. That's not the case. Somebody who is at the end of life um, does not have uh, the same productivity as someone who is a, a healthy working age um, individual. That is just not the case. And it's because that's not the case, and it's because um, we, we may not wish for someone's productivity to enter into the equation when we're allocating healthcare resources, that it's so controversial to consider uh, productivity um, in an economic evaluation when it's used for the purpose of allocating our public healthcare resources. So a better approach in my view would be for us to just recognize this. Recognize that productivity by its very nature differs from one individual to another. If society takes actual productivity into account when allocating healthcare resources, it must recognize that this will inevitably disadvantage some individuals. If this is considered unacceptable, the only solution is society to not take productivity into account when allocating limited healthcare resources. I don't think that it's an acceptable solution to pretend that everyone has the same productivity. At that point, we're simply not measuring productivity. Let's return to that document that was presented at the NICE board meeting and see what, rec see what recommendations they made um, in this regard. And what that document said is very similar to what I'm saying right now. Uh, they're saying that an implication of considering productivity is that older and non-working populations will be disadvantaged because no productivity benefits will be associated with the interventions affecting them. And over time, NHS resources, the national health system in the UK, uh, may switch, uh, may shift towards interventions that affect young or working age populations. Um, and this could come into conflict with NHS principles of equality of access. It might violate the Equality Act of 2010 if it's considered to be age discrimination. And these concerns motivated the Swedish HGA agency to switch from a partial societal perspective that included productivity costs to a health sector perspective uh, in 2015. Let's move on quickly to another couple of things considered under a societal perspective. So one is that reduction in criminal behavior. The other is better educational outcomes. And this is the same question that we had a few minutes ago. I'm just gonna change the end of this. So we have two patients who are identical. Uh, they have identical health conditions. They have an identical capacity to derive health benefits from treatment. Should we treat them differently uh, on the basis that one is a university student with high earning potential, the other is a high school dropout with a much lower earning potential? Um, here's a similar question. Uh, one is a, a career criminal who plans to commit further crimes following treatment, uh, while the other law-abiding member of the public. Do you really want to save the life of that career criminal given the societal implications? And you could say, uh, yeah, the patient should be treated differently. We should prioritize treatment for patients who have the greatest educational potential, deprioritize treatment for patients who've engaged in criminal behavior in the past, since doing this maximizes economic benefits for society. Or we could say, no, the patient should be treated identically. Canada's public healthcare system should treat people slow, uh, solely on the basis of their clinical need. If two patients have the same capacity to derive health benefits from a given treatment, they should be treated identically regardless of their educational potential, their criminal record, or any other non-health characteristics. And if you're reading this thinking, yeah, that sounds about right, I agree with that as a matter of principle, it shouldn't matter what your education is, uh, what your criminal history is, we should treat people according to their clinical need. Well then do you really want educational status, educational outcomes to be a part of an economic evaluation that informs who gets what treatment? So my recommendation is, before making any revision to its perspective, Canada should provide clarity as to its position on these fundamental normative issues. If Canada wishes to avoid discrimination on the basis 
of any non-health related characteristics, then it should not adopt a societal perspective, or at least not a, a full societal perspective. You know, Kenneth really needs to think, really needs to think about what its values are and in what respects is it willing to tolerate discrimination, right? Before considering uh, adding these things to its perspective. Let's now talk about Caliph's $50,000 uh, informal uh, cost effectiveness threshold. And the reason I say it's informal is if you read Caliph's guidelines for economic evaluation, you will not see any mention within these guidelines of that $50,000 per dollar threshold. There is no section uh, talking about the threshold, talking about where that $50,000 comes from. And yet, if you look at any of Caliph's reimbursement recommendations, you will see this threshold there. So this is the recommendation published just last month for Tricafta. And if you read that recommendation, you will see language like this. And you see similar language in all of Caliph's uh, recommendations. Um, so at these ISAs, Tricafta is not cost effective at a $50,000 per quality gained willingness to pay threshold. Uh, again, there's this language later in that, in, in that paragraph, cost effective at a $50,000 per quality gained threshold. And CADF actually uses this informal threshold to determine what price reduction to recommend to the payers and to the PCPA. So in that second uh, clipping, you can see uh, a price reduction in excess of 94% for Tricafta is required for Tricafta to be considered cost effective at a willingness to pay threshold of $50,000. So this is extremely important. If you were to change that threshold, if it was something other than 50,000, well, then that would change the price reduction that Cadeth is reporting in its in its uh, in its guideline in its uh, recommendations. Okay, so it's a very very important part of of Cadeth's, uh, guidelines and its recommendations. So, what is that threshold? Where should it come from in principle? Um, let's go back to this slide from earlier. Uh, we're back to looking at a publicly funded health system perspective now. Recall that we had the expected health improvements and the expected health losses. Those expected health improvements are reported by CADF in its economic evaluations, right? They will report the incremental qualities that the technology provides. But what CADF don't report is the expected health losses. They report the incremental costs, but they don't do the next step of converting them into the expected health losses. So how would we go about doing that in principle? The expected health losses are estimated by considering how else the payer could otherwise invest the dollars required to adopt the new technology. So we talked earlier about how those dollars could be spent on uh, reducing waiting lists for other treatments. It could be spent on expanding primary care, providing more Canadians with access to a family doctor. Um, there are all sorts of purposes that those dollars could be used for. And suppose that these dollars would otherwise be invested in reducing waiting lists for other treatments, and that doing so would provide one quality for every $30,000 invested. And I'm going to talk in a few moments about where that 30,000 number uh, comes from. Now, if this were the case, and if the new technology is adopted instead, well, those $30,000 are not spent reducing waiting lists anymore, and we've lost one quality elsewhere. We've foregone one quality. Okay, so the expected health loss in this example would be one quality for every $30,000 allocated to the new technology. So if Cadeth reports that the incremental cost is 300,000, you would divide that 300,000 by the 30,000 per quality, and there's an expected health loss of 10 qualities. So it's really important to understand what return we get on marginal investments in our public healthcare systems. That's really important. There was some research conducted by the University of York back in 2018 on behalf of the PMPRB, which estimated that marginal investments in Canada's public healthcare systems would provide approximately one quality for every $30,000 invested. So that's where the number came from on the previous slide. Uh, this is the report in question, if anyone's interested in reading it. The URL is extremely long, but I've provided a forwarding URL here uh, that will take you to that report on the PMPRB's website. Now, another way of getting this would be to look at international studies that have been published. Uh, there was a recent in, a systematic review um, by an international team of authors that estimated peer-reviewed, identified peer-reviewed estimates of the marginal investment required to produce one quality within the public healthcare systems of a number of developed countries. So these are countries that have public systems similar to Canada. These four countries happen to be on the PMPRB 11 list of countries that are considered sufficiently similar to Canada to be used for the purpose of reference pricing. Uh, so we might expect that the return that you would get from marginal investments in their public health systems are similar to what you would get in Canada's public health care systems. 
an unpublished white paper that I prepared for Cadeth back in 2022 converted these estimates into Canadian dollars, accounting for both inflation and purchasing power parity. And although this is unpublished, you can easily do these calculations yourself. Um, and the median was found to be approximately one quality for every $30,000 invested. So very similar to what the uh, University of York found in its work for the PMPRB. And this is the review that I just mentioned, uh, well worth reading. Uh, it identifies all of the, the peer reviewed estimates um, internationally uh, as of the time of publication a, a couple of years ago. So if $30,000 per quality is an accurate estimate of the expected return from investing in marginal healthcare services within Canada's public healthcare systems, this raises questions about the $50,000 the 50, per quality threshold that Cadeth informally uses right now. And just to illustrate why there could be a problem with that, here's a very simple example. Imagine that there's a new health technology and the ISA is exactly $50,000 per quality. So that would be considered cost effective by Cadeth right now. And yet every incremental $150,000 that we invest in this technology would be expected to provide three qualities, 150 divided by 50, uh, 150,000 divided by 50,000 will give you three qualities compared to five qualities if the same dollars were invested in other marginal healthcare services, right? We'd get a quality for every 30,000. So we'd get five qualities instead. And so there's an expected health loss of two qualities by taking money that could have been used to reduce waiting lists and spending it on the new technology instead. That's assuming the technology is priced up to 50,000 per quality. And so the recommendation I would have for Cadeth is, um, first of all, it needs to be clear that there is a threshold, right? That needs to be in the guidelines. OK, there is a threshold that is used in every report that Cadeth published. So there should be uh, some information in the guidelines on where that threshold comes from. In my view, that threshold should be based on empirical evidence of the expected return from investing in marginal healthcare services within Canada's public healthcare systems. The current evidence we have suggests that technologies priced up to $50,000 per quality may not improve public health. Uh, having said that, there are not many estimates so far, uh, and so Canada should support further research to generate more robust estimates of this expected return. But in principle, this should be evidence-based and it should be much more formal uh, than it is uh, right now. Now, what would the impact be of adopting a societal perspective? So recall that under a publicly funded health system perspective, we're comparing the expected health improvements to the expected health losses. Now, if CADA were to adopt a societal perspective, its consideration of the expected benefits arising from new technologies would need to be broader, encompassing not only the expected health improvements, but also the many non-health impacts considered earlier in the presentation, such as productivity benefits, educational benefits. There are all sorts of other benefits that go beyond health, and those would need to be considered as part of the benefits of the technology. So it's not just expected health improvements, it's now expected societal improvements that include health, but also productivity, and many, many other uh, benefits. But the other side of the coin here is that Cadet's consideration of the expected losses would also need to be broader, encompassing not only health losses, but also the societal implications of those health losses, including productivity and consumption losses for patients and their caregivers, and impacts on private insurers. So I've said already in this presentation that if the dollars that are spent on a new technology are not then spent on reducing waiting lists or providing more Canadians with access to a family doctor, then there are health implications for those patients. Well, it's more than that. If patients have worse health because they have poor access to, fam uh, to a family doctor, they're also going to have worse productivity. It might be that patients stuck on a really long waiting list end up paying out of pocket to go to the United States. That's going to have an impact society, but that would not be considered under the public health care payer perspective. It might be that if other treatments are delisted or the waiting list becomes so long that patients end up going private, that has an impact on private insurers. So that needs to be considered from a societal perspective. And so the consideration of what we call the opportunity cost is now very different. It's no longer just health. We need to consider the expected societal losses that arise due to the incremental cost of new technologies. And under a societal perspective, a treatment is considered cost effective if funding it is expected to have a positive incremental net benefit, taking into account not just population health, and any non-health impacts, but also the value assigned to each. And this is another complicating factor under societal perspective. Now that we're going beyond health, 
we need to assign a value to health so that it can be traded off against other things such as education outcomes, productivity. We need to actually put a value on each. We need to accept that we would no longer be making recommendations that maximize population health, but instead health would be explicitly traded off against other things of value. And so the, the objective would no longer be to improve health outcomes, it would be to improve societal outcomes. Uh, and it might, be, it might result in Cadiff recommending a course of action that does not actually provide better health outcomes, but it, uh, it does provide other societal benefits. And the flip side under a societal perspective is that if those expected societal losses are greater than the societal improvements, well, then it would be considered not cost effective. It would have a negative incremental net benefit. So this raises the question, would Cadeth need to adjust its $50,000 per quality informal threshold if it adopts a societal perspective? And the short answer is yes, Cadeth would need to adjust its threshold. The reason being that adopting a societal perspective impacts how we value the opportunity cost associated with reimbursing health technologies within Canada's public healthcare systems. And this in turn has important implications for Cadeth's informal cost effectiveness threshold. And there was a paper published last year uh, titled The Broader Opportunity Costs in the Broader Cost Effectiveness Analysis Framework, which again, I would strongly recommend reading. It talks about how when you expand the scope of the analysis, right, you expand that perspective to consider things beyond health. Well, you also need to expand your consideration of opportunity cost. It's no longer just health foregone. It's all of the productivity foregone. It's all of the other societal implications that arise from other patients having worse health than they otherwise would do. If we go back to the uh, document presented at the NICE board meeting, again, they are highlighting the same issue that I am highlighting here. Uh, there are significant evidence gaps on the wider societal benefits of currently provided services, the, the things that would be displaced by new interventions. And given that NICE formally acknowledges the health effects of displaced services when making its recommendation, they need to extend that uh, and adopt the same approach when it comes to wider societal effects. And as they say, NICE should investigate if and how its cost of fairness threshold should be changed. So what direction would CAVS need to adjust its threshold and by how much? Now, this is a very difficult question to answer, but what we can, what we can do is look at a paper that was published a few years ago by Kim and colleagues, which was an extremely large review of about 7,000 cost per quality studies published internationally between 1970, 1974 and 2018. And they did a sub-analysis on those studies that were published in the last year or so, so 2017 to 2018, and which had both a healthcare sector and a societal perspective. So there's not many of these, not many studies that adopt both perspectives and are recent, uh, but they focused on the 16 cost per quality studies that met those criteria. They reported both perspectives. And what they found was that the median ISA from a societal perspective, about 22,700 US dollars, and that's more favorable than from a healthcare sector perspective, which was just over 30,000 US dollars. And so the median ISA from these studies is about 25% lower than from a societal, from a societal perspective uh, than it is from a healthcare sector perspective. So we might expect that if CADIS were to adopt a societal perspective, the average ISA, the typical ISA of a new technology appraised by Cadeth would fall by about 25% based on this study here. This is the study, if you're interested uh, in reading it, it was published in Pharmacoeconomics back in 2020. And a key unknown here, a really critical unknown, is whether the observed reduction in the ISA for the technologies in the Kim paper is greater than, less than, or similar to the reduction in the ISA that we would see for the marginal investment opportunities that comprise the opportunity cost of reimbursing new technologies. So shortening waiting lists across Canada. Okay, I've said a few moments ago that that would not only diminish health, but it would also have societal implications. Well, to what extent, right? And you know, would it result, if we were to try and calculate the ISA of those displaced services, would that ISA be 25% lower as well when we extend the analysis to a societal perspective? Now, if that is the case, if these are similar, it, it follows logically that CADA's threshold should be reduced by around 25% under a societal perspective. So a really substantial 
reduction in Cadeth's threshold. So before uh, adopting a societal perspective, Cadeth would have to consider very carefully the implications for its cost effectiveness threshold. And furthermore, a change in Cadeth's perspective would not impact provincial healthcare budgets. Right? So if Cadeth were to change its perspective, provincial healthcare budgets would stay the same. And logically, the total net budget impact of all of the cost effective technologies and services funded from within that budget cannot increase following a change in the perspective. And it follows from this that unless the technologies reviewed by Cadeth systematically differ from other investment opportunities in terms of their societal benefits, implementation of a societal perspective should not result in any systematic change in the number of technologies found to be cost effective by Cadeth nor any systematic change in the average price reduction required for technologies to appear cost effective. There will obviously be exceptions. There will be some technologies where the societal benefits are really substantial. And so there would be a greater price reduction recommended, uh, sorry, a lesser price reduction recommended by Cadeth uh, under a societal perspective. But the reverse can also be true. Uh, so uh, one indicator, if Cadeth were to implement a societal perspective, that perhaps that threshold has not been adjusted properly, would be if we saw a systematic change in the number of technologies being found cost effective or a change in that average price reduction over uh, the many different technologies that Cadeth reviews. So my recommendation would be, if Cadeth were to adopt a societal perspective, it should reduce its informal $50,000 per quality threshold so that it's consistent with the broader consideration of opportunity costs under a societal perspective. Based on the findings of Kim et al. 2022, an approximately 25% reduction may be required. That said, this is such an important part of Cadeth's reviews, and this would have such a big impact on those price reductions reported by Cadeth that I wouldn't recommend that Cadeth just base it purely on the Kim study. Cadeth needs to do its own research on this prior to adopting any societal perspective. This is a very, very important consideration prior to adopting a societal perspective. Here's a follow-up question. What if Cadeth were to adopt a societal perspective without making any revisions to its informal cost-effectiveness threshold? And because those ICEs uh, were found by Kim to be around 25% lower, under a societal perspective, any adoption of a societal perspective by Cadeth without a corresponding reduction in its threshold would open the door to higher prices for new technologies because you could have higher prices at that same threshold that we have right now. And because public healthcare budgets ac across Canada would remain constrained, this would be expected to reduce overall population health outcomes. And this is exactly what the document prepared for the NICE board meeting found as well. Uh, that including these benefits under a wider societal perspective would add value to interventions that are already more effective, and it could motivate manufacturers of health technologies to increase what they consider to be economic justifiable price. Um, and under a health sector perspective, these wider benefits accrue incidentally anyway. And they point out that reducing their relatively high pharmaceutical expenditure was the motiva motivation for the Portuguese HCA agency to switch to a health sector perspective in 2019, having previously included productivity costs under a wider societal perspective. Uh, they say the inclusion of productivity savings resulted in lower ICEs, which were then used by manufacturers to justify higher prices during negotiations. So it's entirely predictable that that would happen in Canada were Canada to adopt a societal perspective. Worse, any adoption of a societal perspective by Cadeth without a corresponding reduction in its threshold would also raise the possibility that a new technology could be considered cost effective by Cadeth when its reimbursement by a Canadian public payer would not only diminish population health outcomes, but also worsen broader societal outcomes. And to illustrate this, because it's a somewhat complex point, why would this be the case? Let's consider a very, very simple example with some simple numbers. So suppose that a payer can invest a million dollars into a new technology or invest that same amount into reducing waiting lists. And suppose that reducing waiting lists would provide 20 qualities of benefit. So that's $50,000 per quality. Okay, so if it actually is 30,000, it would be more qualities than this, but let's just keep the numbers simple. Suppose that a new technology provides 25 qualities for that million dollars. So that has an ICER of 40,000. So right now that would be considered cost-effective under this healthcare payer perspective. Um, if alternatively this new technology provided 15 qualities, well now that ISA is higher than $50,000. And right now under a healthcare payer perspective, 
that would be considered not cost effective. So nice and simple so far. Now imagine that Cadeth, uh, or before we do this, now imagine that Cadeth wants to adopt a societal perspective. And to do that, they need to move to a, a net benefit framework where we're going to value each quality at $50,000 and to report the, the value, the total value of those qualities. So it's a, an important step before we start adding additional things into the economic evaluation, because we need to assign a value to each thing. So the 20 qualities from reducing waiting lists, that's worth a million dollars. And the 15 qualities from the new technology, that's worth 750,000 qualities. So still, we're finding this technology not to be cost effective. But now imagine that a societal perspective is adopted, and it's done in a way that does not uh, there is not a corresponding change in the cost effectiveness threshold. So that opportunity cost on the left hand side is going to be ignored. There's going to be no change in that. All that's going to happen is the societal perspective will be considered for the new technology only. And there are half a million dollars of societal benefits. So the total value is now $1.25 million. Okay, no change in the threshold, which means no change in how the opportunity costs are valued. Well, the technology appears cost effective. The problem here, of course, is that once we move to a societal perspective, you have to also value the societal opportunity cost. And if you were to do that, you would find perhaps that because there's a greater health gain, there's 20 qualities instead of 15, perhaps the societal benefits are greater as well. And in this case, the total value in this example is higher uh, under the opportunity cost. So the technology would not be considered cost effective. But by only considering the societal impacts of the new technology and not changing that consideration of opportunity cost, you'd make an error and say that this technology appears cost effective when actually it not only reduces population health outcomes by providing fewer qualities, but the societal benefits are smaller as well. So my recommendation would be Canada should not adopt a societal perspective unless it's prepared to make a corresponding adjustment to its cost effectiveness threshold. Doing so would be expected to diminish population health outcomes and possibly societal outcomes, not in every case, but it's possible. Although it would favor the manufacturers of new technologies and patients who benefit from new technologies, it would cause harm to other patients treated within Canada's public healthcare systems. And if we believe that every patient should be given an equal voice at the decision-making table, it is vital that we consider the implications, the health implications and the societal implications for those other patients who are impacted by that in incremental cost of new technologies. So finally, uh, recommendations. Um, let's go back to that document from NICE that they presented. What was their recommendation? They recommended to the board of NICE to approve option two. If you recall, option two was retain that health payer perspective, but really formalize the conditions under which uh, a broader perspective would be considered. Really strengthen the processes within NICE so those existing flexibilities are utilized optimally and consistently. That was the recommendation. They also said, despite legitimate theoretical arguments in favor of formally adopting a wider societal perspective, there were also substantial ethical, practical, and methodological challenges that must be addressed for it to be implemented successfully and in line with NICE principles. Significant amounts of NICE resources over multiple years would be required to facilitate engagement with public institutions and other stakeholders and address the methods and evidence needs. We know that the commitment of these resources may not improve the quality of NICE recommendations and would likely limit NICE's ability to address other current priorities and strategic aims, and therefore do not recommend this option. And I think this would apply equally to CADF, that there would be a much greater burden on the economics team at CADF if they had to model a societal perspective instead of just the healthcare payer perspective. And it is not obvious that the benefits would be worth that substantial additional resource that would be required. And in the NICE board meeting, if you look at the minutes, which are available at this URL, they recommended, they accepted that recommendation and the board decided uh, to uh, keep a health payer perspective, but really formalize those conditions under which uh, non-reference case analyses are considered. So my recommendation here would be that for now, Cali should retain its current recommendation of a publicly funded healthcare payer perspective as the reference case with that flexibility to consider broader perspectives within a non-reference case analysis. So there will be cases where it's considered appropriate to consider a broader uh, perspective to, implement, to, to integrate some of those considerations from a societal perspective. And the current recommendation from CADF in their guidelines allows for that flexibility. 
But I do think that Cather should follow NICE's lead and take steps to ensure that that flexibility is applied consistently across all of the economic evaluations that it considers. Before considering any potential change to its perspective, I think that Cather should commission research into the expected impacts on patients, including the potential for discrimination, and also the expected impact that such a change would have on Cather's informal cost effectiveness threshold for the reasons that I've given in this presentation. The consequences of an incomplete or inconsistent implementation of a societal perspective are serious, and they include a reduction in population health outcomes, and possibly in some cases, a reduction in societal outcomes as well. And so that needs to be taken uh, seriously by Cadeth. And if anyone's interested in seeing this presentation again, or a longer version uh, of this presentation, you can scan that QR code or, or visit that URL, and it will take you to my YouTube channel where you can uh, watch this presentation. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Paulden, for the great presentation. We now invite attendees to use the Q&A function on the Zoom software menu. And anyone with further questions after today's webinar is encouraged to email noah at iichi.ca. So we can give the attendees a couple of minutes to type in their questions. Um, Mike, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm just looking at the Q&A here. So uh, if productivity is so controversial, why not using as a ref case a revised societal that would remove the productivity component, right? So so you don't need to go all in, right, on a societal perspective. Um, you can consider, um, you know, just parts of the perspective if you wish. Um, and so when I did that thought experiment earlier about, you know, would you prioritize? Do you think it's appropriate to prioritize on the basis of someone's income? And then I extended to what about education? Uh, what about criminal history? So what I would encourage you to do is, is think about what, what you would like to incorporate in addition, run through that thought experiment, and is it consistent with our principles? And if it is, then yes, there's there's no issue in incorporating a, you know, a partial societal perspective um, into Cadiz. Uh, evaluations. Uh, I say there's no issue, there's the practical issue of you now need to think about the opportunity cost slightly differently. It's no longer just healthy, it would have to incorporate that additional consideration. But yeah, absolutely, you don't have to go, it's not an all or nothing thing, right? You can consider um, some aspects of the societal perspective and then drop those that you don't feel comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, the next one is where did 50,000 per quality actually come from? And since when is this threshold used informally by CAD? The actual, uh, there is a paper by Peter Newman and colleagues. Um, I didn't give a link in this presentation, um, but maybe someone can put it in the chat. Um, so there, there is a paper published a few years ago talking about where that 50,000 threshold came from. Uh, it's actually an American paper because 50,000 has also been used informally in the United States. Um, I would say that from a theoretical point of view, uh, health economists like myself have been talking for, for many years about supply side and demand side approaches to estimating a cost effectiveness threshold, the empirical work that's been done. 50,000 predates all of that. It is, it is not based on either a, a supply or a demand side approach. It's, it's, it's arbitrary. Uh, it's a, a benchmark that's been used for, for many, many years. The elder has said, what are the societal aspects that need to be decided on if the societal perspective was chosen. Do you, uh, Ellen, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Um, I'll, I'll let you elaborate that and then I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, what were the reasons for Canada to shift from society perspective to publicly funded perspective? Um, I don't believe they are actually given in the third edition of the guidelines. So I will let someone from Canada answer that. It's going back uh, almost 20 years now, um, but I don't recall there being any explanation given in the third edition of the guidelines. Uh, it's possible that it's because NICE and others internationally had very clearly said that they have a healthcare payer perspective by that point. And so Cadeth was bringing itself into line. Um, but if, if anyone's on the call who was uh, around at Cadeth back in 2006, uh, I was not. So uh, yeah. Um, what do you think about a whole of government perspective that would just include costing of by? Yeah. So, so the question from Rebecca, I think that's an excellent question. Um, so that broader government payer perspective, 
Um, and yes, there has been some work done on this um, around the advantage of this. I think there is a lot to be said about this. The challenge we would face is um, how do you quantify outcomes in different sectors and how do you make the trade-offs between different sectors? But there has been some work done by the University of York and uh, perhaps someone can put a link in the chat. It was a paper, a uh, research paper from 2007, um, which, which talks about how you would, in theory, how you would trade off between different sectors like this under a whole of government perspective. Um, but yeah, uh, the example they gave actually was uh, free school meals. And the argument they made is that free school meals provide health benefits and education benefits. And it might be the case that the health benefits don't justify the cost alone. And the education benefits alone don't justify the cost. But if you combine the two benefits, well, then it is worth the cost. So if you left this to either the health sector or the education sector to pay for the free school meals, they might consider just looking at their own silo. This is not worth paying for. But if they were to consider this together, it would be worth paying for. And maybe they could do a cost sharing. That was their point about the inefficiencies that arise from having this siloed uh, approach. If Kadath, so from Eldon, if Kadath follows NICE, and make sure all, oh, here we go. If kind of follows nice and make sure all societal perspectives are the same. So what are the sort of aspects that need to be decided on? Right, so um, the issue with the societal perspective is there are many different things that you could include or not include. So if you allow uh, those who submit economic evaluations to Calif to choose which of these they include, right? You might have a manufacturer submit an economic, economic evaluation to, to Calif that includes productivity, because the productivity benefits are positive for that technology, but they haven't included other aspects because they're negative for that technology, right? And then if you don't have a, a consistency in which of these additional uh, components are considered across economic evaluations, well, then you're going to have this bias creep in where those who, the analysts who do economic evaluations might only include those that are uh, positive, right? Um, and so Cadith would then have to fill in the gaps, right? Cadith's economics team right now do an excellent job when an economic evaluation is conducted, they will look at the assumptions, correct some of those assumptions, and give new estimates of the ISA, for example. Well, they'd now have to look at, OK, which of these aspects of the societal perspective have been modeled and which haven't? And they, they would be responsible for filling in the gaps in this case. right? So this is why it would be a, a greater burden on Cadath, unless Cadath would have very, very clear criteria. That when you submit an economic evaluation, you must, uh, you must uh, provide all of these different societal estimates, uh, but it would increase the burden on the analyst at that point. Um, another question here. So if, if investing $30,000 is producing one quality in the system, then every technology that has an ISA over 30,000 is actually not producing any qualities from a system point of view. Uh, no, technologies with an ISA above 30,000, <laughs> excuse me, they would be producing uh, qualities, um, but uh, a reallocation of resources at the margin of the system will produce more qualities. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so technologies that are priced higher than 30,000, there could be an improvement in population health by reallocating away from those um, to, to other technologies. But one of the takeaways from this presentation, I hope, is to really think through, you know, what are the other uses of those limited healthcare dollars, right? The dollars that are spent on a new health technology, um, what else could they be put to? Uh, what are the purpose? And right now, you know, we see in the media every day that there are waiting lists across Canada. Um, you know, we're facing a crisis in our public healthcare systems. There are some very valuable alternative uses that we could put those dollars to. Um, and so uh, it is those, it's the investment, the benefit we would get from investing in these other, you know, expanding primary care, uh, reducing waiting lists, that should inform the cost effectiveness threshold. And if a technology has a price so that its ice is above that threshold, it doesn't automatically mean we should say no. It means that we should be aware that the likely impact on population health is negative. And that's something that Cadath ought to report. And it's something that payers and PCPA can then take into account when they're negotiating over the price, when they're making decisions about whether or not to reimburse this technology. I think Cadath should provide that information to the payers. Cadath should look at the evidence and estimate how much impact do we expect this technology to have on patients and then let the payers PCPA and they make their own decisions. Um, okay, there's no more questions in the Q&A. Are there any in the chat? Um, I see there's a, and do we have any more time, Nigar? I think we've gone a few minutes over. I'm happy to stay for a few more minutes. Um, yeah, the, the attendees are welcome to stay for longer um, if they have any questions. Yeah. 
Um, I see that um, someone's put a link in the chat. Thanks very much for putting the link in the chat to the uh, $50,000 paper. Um, there's been a couple of papers on, on where that 50,000 has come from. Uh, John, John has a comment. Do you have any comments on the issue that maximizing qualities from public funding investments is not the central tenant of how we allocate resources outside of drugs? Yeah, absolutely. This is not necessarily the single objective. Uh, what I would say in response to that is, I do think that improving health outcomes is one of many, one of many uh, considerations when payers uh, make decisions about whether to adopt a new technology. And so what I would recommend that Cadeth do is they align that informal threshold with the evidence of how much benefit those dollars could get elsewhere. So $30,000 per quality or wherever the evidence takes us in future. That is how Cadeth should set its threshold. Then Cadeth can make a recommendation to payers to say, you need a price reduction of X percent in order that this technology improves population health, care, population health outcomes rather than diminishing. At that point, it's up to the payer. If the payer, as John says, if the payer has a different objective, if the payer wishes to take other things into account, they can do. But what Cadeth has provided there is some really important information to take into account in the decision. It's not the only information, but it's really important, I think, for a payer to know that when the price is this high, it's going to, we expect it to diminish population health. Not the only thing that matters, uh, but I would also say it's not something that doesn't matter, right? And so for that reason, it's really important that CADAP has an evidence-informed uh, cost-effectiveness threshold. Are there any further questions, Nigar, or have we answered them all? I think uh, you've answered all of them, and thank you so much again, Dr. Paulden, for the fantastic presentation, and thanks to everyone online for attending. Uh, the topic of our next NOAA seminar is Access, Health, and Wealth, the Short and Long-Run Effects of the Saskatchewan Municipal Physician System on Rural, rural Access to Physicians, Health Improvements, and Economic Well-Being. Presented by Dr. Stevenson Strobel, a physician and current postdoc research associate at Cornell University. It will take place on Friday, uh, February 21st at noon. Uh, please visit uh, noaa.ca to register and subscribe to our mailing list for news on upcoming events. And thank you very much again um, to all attendees for joining and have a great rest of your day. Thanks very much, everyone.